very good morning to all of you, my fellow African diaspora. Good morning. I'd like to thank our moderator for the most wonderful introduction. And I also want to thank the organizers of this amazing event, the children of Africa, who are truly saying, enough is enough. That our circumstances as black people around the globe can be better, should be better, and will be better. Amen. <laughs> I was being interviewed by one gentleman about two years ago. And he asked me, who do I listen to? Who did I get my inspiration from? And it dawned on me that actually I never quite stopped to think about it. But as I was struggling to answer that question, it suddenly occurred to me that while my father may be gone, that I still to a great extent listen to him. That a lot of what I do, what I think, those are whispers that continue to come. And he reminds me every day of where we came from. I was reminded of the stories that I grew up hearing from my father, growing up in the country of then Rhodesia. But prior to them, British coming to Zimbabwe, we were none other than the powerful Monomotapa kingdom. And my father recalled to me and all of us in the family over and over again, how our land in Zimbabwe was taken by the British. If you were a veteran of the First World War, or just an adventurous Briton, First or Second World War, you were guaranteed 2,000 hectares of land in Zimbabwe, then Rhodesia, plus any loot from the local people. I repeat, if you were a veteran of the First or Second World War, or just simply an adventurous Briton, you were guaranteed 2,000 hectares of land in Rhodesia, plus any loot from the local people. The British were encouraged to loot from the local people. They even have that law in the books today. It's called the British Loot Law. <laughs> Those on the ground, the Rhodesians, the British who were on the ground, they had divided Zimbabwe and Rhodesia then into four regions. The first region was the perfect region for agriculture. It had the perfect rain, perfect soil. Region 2 was pretty close to Region 1. Region 3, not so good, perfect for cattle ranching. And Region 4, nobody should live there. It didn't rain. The soil was like sun, like a desert. And it was infested with tesla flies and mosquitoes. So the British set out to move the Zimbabwean people from Region 1 and Region 2, even Region 3 into Region 4. So when you landed in Zimbabwe as a British, you were directed in the Region 1 or Region 2 area. And the way a British marked out his land is by getting on a horse and riding in one direction until either him or his horse was tired. Then he would put his back. And the following day, he would wake up again and do the same thing. So it took the British man four days to mop up his land. And when he was done, everything in that land was his, minus the people. They would then go to the villages within that newly acquired land, and they would tell the villagers that in this direction, go past this mountain. In this direction, go past this river, because your land is now mine. 
and the people left with whatever they could carry. My father was a young man of about, young boy of about 13 years. You see, we don't quite know exactly what his birthday was, but we do know that he was born in the year of the leaves. And when that year of the leaves, it just so happened that there was a year that was very peculiar in the sense that so many leaves were shedded. And everybody remembers that year of the leaves. In doing our history, the year of the leaves was 2019. Not 2019, 1919. So we assume he was around 13 years of age when this particular situation occurred in his village. As a young man, he remembers waking up early hours of the morning and there was pandemonium in the village. Everyone was running around the village, scattered around, and there were these men on horses, the men without knees, they called them. You see, when you wear pants, you look like you have no knees. <laughs> so they called them the men without knees on horses. They were running around the village and torching the huts. The whole village was ablaze. And everybody was running away with whatever they could carry on their heads. My aunt, brother, his aunt, was pregnant and was due any day. So they had to ask this man without knees for permission to allow her to stay until she could deliver. So they had negotiated that her heart was the only one that could not be set on fire. So they decided that maybe if we just left one young person, a child, just maybe that the British would not kill them. So it was my aunt, my, his aunt, who was pregnant, a grandmother who was the midwife, her husband, and another sister, and my father, who stayed behind in this village that had been torched up. And they were huddled in this one little hut. And my father recounts the biggest fear that he had every morning was the fear that this white man without knees on a horse would stop by every morning and wanted to know whether or not his aunt had delivered. Sadly for them, it took three weeks before she could deliver. And three days after she delivered, they were asked to walk. We didn't care where you go, just get away from now my land. And unfortunately for them, no sooner had they landed in what they thought would be their new home, before they could regroup, yet another British came out and mapped out his land. And once again, here they were. So they decided this time, they were just gonna go as far away as they can, hoping that no other white men would come and claim their land as theirs. That is the story I grew up being told by my father. And he would always say, where our land originally was, it was now the land that was owned by Oppenheimer of Oppenheimer fans. And when we would drive past that land, you could drive at 120 kilometers an hour, and you were still on his farm. His farm was larger than the country of Belgium. And my father would always say, someday, we will get our land back from these thieves. I grew up truly believing that the British were thieves. Because as a young girl, that's what my father told me. And I believe him. And based on that story, you cannot deny that. So those who chose to say the way in which the land was taken in Zimbabwe, I would always say, let me tell you my story from my father. Let me tell you how the land was taken. And that is our truth, that we were denied. We were told lies. Then you fast forward over a century later. I often say, 
I'm the granddaughter of a grandfather who was dispossessed of his land. And then my white Caucasian friend is a granddaughter of the thief who stole the land from my grandfather. I'm simply asking that me as the dispossessed granddaughter who has lived an underprivileged life because of the actions of your grandfather and you who has lived a privileged life out of the loot from your grandfather it's now 2019 you and I we know what's right let's sit down and talk about this let's fix this the right way but instead, my colleague then says, but I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> this land is now mine. To which I will also say, but I also had nothing to do with it. <laughs> I've lived an underprivileged life. What's right is right. And what is wrong is wrong. So the truth of the matter is because you will not agree to fix this situation, do you want me to beat you up? <laughs> Before you can do the right thing? Or are you going to be civilized enough and do the right thing? Because if the truth be told, going back to my grandfather, we have been the civilized ones. And you and your grandfather have been the uncivilized ones. How long is it going to take before you can do the right thing? And the story did not go on just in Zimbabwe. The story is repeated around the globe. The injustices that was told to me by my father, the injustices that I grew up with in Rhodesia, those injustices continue around the globe. What is it about us black people that we are hated so much? What is it that we as black people have done to the world to deserve the disrespect that we uniformly experience no matter where you find us on the globe. We are the most exploited and abused race in the history of humanity. And yet we are the origins of humanity as we know it. I often say, particularly us black women, we gave birth to the first human being. Without us, there would not be any other races, and that is a fact. Ladies, let's put a hand together for the black women. I was talking to the Queen Mother, and she said, what can first the chicken or the egg? One group said the chicken, and the other group said the egg. Queen Mother said no. You see, the black woman is the only one who can, find, who can have a child without a man. She said the black woman came with the egg. The two came together. <laughs> I'm saying this to say we are an amazing race as black people that we have been lied to. We have been told that we do not matter. We have been told that we are inferior to others. Far from the truth. Civilization as we know it began in Africa and it stayed in Africa. The history books have been distorted to begin when they want the history to begin. You see, they say history is his story. We must have his story and her story because her story is yet to be told. From 
Berlin conference. Going back to 400 years, we started bringing Africans across the Atlantic to the part for the continuation of colonization, to just downright continued exploitation of Africa. The richest continent on earth does not dictate the price of not even one natural resource. The divisions that were intentional policies put in place to see to it that Africa and her children are forever defeated and dominated 135 years ago remain in place today. The colonizers on one hand, they say, we are giving you independence. But on the other hand, you must sign this document that you agree to continue to be colonized. And those who dare refuse to sign that document, they found their heads on the chopping block. They were assassinated. That started between 1958 and 1961, when we were, quote unquote, getting our independence. We are now in 2019. And the bid continues. And the bid goes on. The question I have is, how bad do things have to be before we black people can say enough is enough? France single-handedly is taking over $500 billion out of the continent. And by the time they finish investing it in their own stock market under the French name, they are realizing upwards of trillions of dollars every year. It's not that we don't know it. We know it. We know it's happening. But nobody's saying anything. That's just France. 75% of the natural resources being traded on the London Stock Exchange are coming from Africa. We all know it. But we do nothing about it. You see, when they send missionaries to Africa, they gave them strict instructions. They said, you shall teach the Africans how to read, but not to reason. I repeat. You shall teach the Africans how to read, but not how to reason. The same was perpetuated with the slaves. Keep them from thinking through things. Program them to take only what you tell them. In other words, put them to sleep. We've been put to sleep. The question is, how long do you choose to continue to be asleep? We have children, my brothers and sisters, that have no clue as to what we have been through. Who have not experienced what we have, we have experienced. They're going to have, we have grandchildren who we are going to leave this world the way it is. And they don't even know where to begin. Simply because we have chosen to remain asleep. We, the children of Africa in the diaspora, sophisticated and educated as we are, sometimes we are our own worst enemy. The African Americans are being told your suffering was worse than those on the continent. That the ones on the continent sold you into slavery. Do you honestly believe Leopold left a bed of roses in the Congo? Do you honestly believe the British left a bed of roses in Kenya? No. In Uganda, in Zimbabwe, in South Africa? Do you honestly believe that what they started as they were taking the slaves out of the continent, they stopped? I beg to differ, they did not. If the truth be told, the carnage continues. The exploitation of Africa continues unabated. And we seem totally powerless to do something about it. We have this unfounded fear of what may happen to us if we speak out. Well, I want you all to know that my father is constantly whispering to me that my dear daughter, are you going to continue to be nice and ask your counterpart to 
negotiate with you about what belongs to you? Or are you just going to take it? Are we going to continue to have Europe tell us that we are a diseased and dying continent? when they are stealing trillions of dollars out of our continent every day. You see, to a great extent, we have us, no one but ourselves to blame. The G7 gave us 261 million a couple of months ago to African women. I don't know some of you, if you saw the announcement. The media went crazy because we got 261 million from the G7. Every journalist that I could get my hands on, I chewed them out. Yeah. How dare you make us believe that 261 million from the G7 was something? Mm. This is not even a crumb under the table. Oh. Oh. I reminded them, do you remember? the Pact for the Continuation of Colonization, that France alone has taken over 500 billion. When you put together the other colonizers, what they have taken out of the continent, we are talking trillions, and you are sitting here and getting and using the platform that you have through the media and spreading nothing but hogwash propaganda. <laughs> Journalists have a responsibility to speak the truth and nothing but the truth. But they're sensitive. But we know better. We should not accept crumbs under the table. We should refuse to be lied to. No more. We must seek the truth. We know who we are. We know what we're capable of doing, particularly the diaspora. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yes. Madam Zuma was very clear when she appointed me as the permanent representative for the African Union. She said, my sister, change is going to come to Africa. But that sustainable change is going to be brought by the diaspora. Amen. But not just any diaspora, but the diaspora in America. You see, in America, we are already integrated. We are not Californians. We are not Floridians. We are Americans. That's not the case in Europe. They may be from France. They are Germans. They are Italians. That's what makes the diaspora in this country unique. Mm. Mm. And because you are unique, you have a responsibility. Yes. Yes. No more shall we sit back and watch our brothers and sisters, our mothers and uncles languish in Africa because of what was done to us and what continues to be done to us. You see, as individual African countries, it is almost mission impossible to push back against the West. You must understand that very clearly. Do you see Togo pushing back against France? No. Do you see Iswatini pushing back against the British? No. And yet we seem to want to waste our energies complaining about the African leaders. You see, the problem of Africa, I liken it to a tree. We could complain about the leaves that are drying up one season after the other. And we keep complaining when the trees dry out. Next season, the leaves are going to come out again and they will dry again and then we complain again. We're complaining about the branches that are drying out and falling off. And we never go to the root. Uh, yeah. And that's why we will always be noisemakers and complainers. And our problems <clears throat> will never be solved. I'm begging all of you to understand that what we are being made to consider as our issues are not our issues. They are not the real issue. They are not the reason why we are where we are today. We must address our issues from the root. And by the root, I'm talking about the Berlin Conference. And understand that the Berlin Conference is alive and well today. 
by dividing Africa into the tiny little economies that we are today, have you ever wondered why is it that to fly from one part of Africa to the other, sometimes it's easier to go to Europe first? It's because the African skies were closed. Have you ever tried to visit three or four African countries on vacation? You send your passport from Iowa to, to Washington. It takes three, four weeks to get your passport back. That's Nigeria. Then you send your passport back to Ghana, the embassy in Washington. In some cases, those embassies are right next to each other. Three, four weeks, your passport comes back. Now you gotta send it back because you wanna go to Egypt. Another three, four weeks. By the time you get your passport back from Egypt, your you visa to Nigeria is expired. <laughs> so what do you do? You say, forget Africa. I'm going to Europe. We laugh about it. But this is what the Lake Conference did. Try buying something with your Malawi kwacha in Nigeria. Mission impossible. So you know what? It's just easier to use the euro or the, or the dollar or the sterling. Mozambique is an oil producing country, but it's all has got to leave. Mozambique can go abroad only for Zimbabwe next door to buy it back 20, 30 times the cost. I was talking to a brother who makes some of the best ceramic tiles in Egypt. He said, my sister, I gotta send my tiles to Italy. Only for my tiles to be relabeled Italian tiles. And then my brothers and sisters on the continent are buying them at 20 to 30 times the cost. I was in Niger with one of our diaspora brothers from Ethiopia. He's a coffee distributor in the United States. He went for breakfast at the hotel where we were staying and he comes running to me and he had taken a few packets of instant coffee from Switzerland. <laughs> and she said, Ambassador, what is going on here? I have to come to Niger to drink coffee from Switzerland? Coffee that I know very well is from East Africa? What is wrong with this picture? For chocolate, mm. cocoa. 65% of the world cocoa comes from West Africa. <laughs> and yet when we see the cocoa, where is it from? It's not, thank you. <laughs> Swiss chocolate. <laughs> what disgusts me, my brothers and sisters, is we know what's going on. And we do absolutely nothing. dumb do we have to be? How stupid do we have to be? Is this going to be generational stupidity? No, no, no. no. Are we just stuck on, at the corner of stupidity and ignorance? No. Thank you, my brother. The answer is no. And that process of saying enough is enough begins with us. And that is why we are here today. To start a movement that we are going to say, as African diaspora, enough is enough. sisters, we are going to have a petition. We're going to start with France because France is the biggest perpetrator. You see, with France, you've got to understand it's downright cash. You see, when you steal from somebody, you respect that if they catch you, 
They might beat you up. So you wait until they are not home to go and steal. You wait until they are facing the other way to pickpocket. You see, France is not doing even that. France is simply saying, give me your money. They're just bullying African countries into, give me your money. And if you don't, I'm going to kill you. Plain and simple. So you see, while we want to go after all the colonizers, France is in a different category. We want to start with the, we want to stop the bleeding. The $500 billion must stay on the continent. Yes. And on top of that, you see, France is easy. We can actually calculate from 1958 the amount of monies the African countries have deposited with France. We are going to claim all that money back. Because we are going to say, enough is enough. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. And then when we finish with France, we equalize the playing field. We get France to be on the same abuse level as the others. <laughs> so to the United Nations we shall say, you, the United Nations, the body that is the defender, the protector of human rights, why are you sleeping with the enemy? France is the member of the UN Security Council. How can we have France as a member of the UN Security Council when France singularly is one of the biggest violators of human rights in Africa? Singularly, France is the biggest risk to peace and security in Africa. And yet nobody is talking about it. So we want to have a million signatures. We shall approach the United Nations. We're going to ask them, why? Why are you allowing this carnage to go on in Africa? Millions of Africans are dying every day because of the activities of France and other colonizers on the continent. Why do you continue to claim to be a body that defends human rights when you are overlooking the biggest violators of human rights? You see, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have this petition, and if they don't listen to us, remember what I said yesterday, that if you men <laughs> If you, black men, who have failed to defend us as your wives, who have failed to, fa to defend us as your sisters, who have failed to defend us as your children, if you don't fix this, then step aside. Because we, because we, the black women, are going to come together and we will fix this. Yeah. You see, in my village in Zimbabwe, when a woman marries, she submits herself to the husband's village. Oh, yes. And you are told you must behave. Don't disrespect us. Take care of everybody. Yes. So the woman runs around like a chicken without a head, taking care of everybody. The husband's brothers, the mother-in-law, the father-in-law, the cousins, everybody is dumping on this woman. And pretty soon, <coughs> she has children of her own, and nobody is helping her. Ten years later, she's exhausted. She has tried to complain. Nobody pays attention. So what does the woman do? She takes off her clothes and she runs around the village, up and down the village, and suddenly, 
everybody starts to listen. The husband even gets in trouble with the elders. They call a quick village meeting to say, what happened? What did you do to her? Why didn't you tell us there's a problem? But the woman has been telling you. And it took the woman taking off her clothes before anybody in the village would listen to her. Well, I got news for you all men. You better be ready. Because if the United Nations does not listen to us, we, the black women, shall march and take over the United Nations building, and we will take off our clothes. being disrespected. We are sick and tired of our children being disrespected. And also because we are saying, enough. commit to being part of a database. The African Continental Free Trade Area is going to be implemented in, Jan in July of next year. We must pull our resources together because that is the only way we can reclaim the economic independence that has been denied to all of us across the globe as black people. No one is going to give us the economic liberation. You see, we have what it takes to take care of ourselves. We don't need aid from anybody. Africa does not need aid. Africa does not need to be rescued. Africa does not need saviors. We can save ourselves. You see, a million people with a thousand dollars, that's a billion dollars. Can we not do that? Yes. And then we do it year in and year out. When we focus all our resources into one bank, yes, yes. the bank that's going to protect us and fund our projects, yes. that is how we get our economic liberation. That's it. No one <clears throat> is going to give it to us. We have to just take it. There's no other way. We are going to take it. And no one is going to stop us. So today, you shall hear a presentation about the Burma Link, which is the database that we should all belong to. Today, you shall hear a presentation about the Diaspora Fund, which is a fund that I hope we can all encourage each other to be part of. And today, there may not be a presentation, but what we will be pulling our funds together is in preparation for Wakanda. Of course, we can't use that name. It belongs to Marvel. But I have a plan. I've spoken to the king of the Ashanti. I said, Your Majesty, this name belongs to us. Could you please write Marvel and humbly let them know that we are taking our name? Yes. I hope you'll do it. <laughs> but be what it is, these are diaspora centers of excellence. You see, the brain drain that has taken place over the years must be reversed. If the truth be told, no amount of money can deliver and build a sustainable Africa because the capacity that Africa needs is in the diaspora. Yeah. 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 There are more Ghanaian doctors in New York City than in the entire country of Ghana. There are more Nigerian doctors in LA than in the entire country of Nigeria. If all the continental doctors and African-American doctors were to go to Africa today, 
we're only going to meet 30% of the need. So let's be clear about one thing. Money alone is not going to do it. <coughs> Capacity building is where it's at. And the teachers and the trainers are right here. address seven pillars of development, starting with the hospital. A nation cannot develop with ailing citizens. Right. A university with technical colleges, agricultural college, infrastructure, hospitality, access to water, access to power. It's a new city in each region that is a developmental hub. All of that built by the diaspora in collaboration with our brothers and sisters on the continent. Yes. Through the database, we shall organize ourselves into healthcare teams. Now, listen to me and follow me clearly. This is a very simple, doable situation. Let's look at the region. We'll divide ourselves into regions. The healthcare team in East Africa will map out East Africa. How many hospitals do we have? How many do we need? We set out to build them. How many doctors do we have? How many do we need? We set out to train. With a five year, 10 year, 15, and golly, by 20 years, Africa is done. Amen. We pick up education. Same thing. We look at infrastructure. Infrastructure. How many kilometers of road do we need? How many do we have? We set out to build roads that make sense. Roads that address the needs of 1.27 billion people. Not people from Kenya, not people from Togo, but Africans. Yes. The expertise that we need is in this room and around this country and around the globe. And all we got to do is organize ourselves. You see, the rest of the other countries around the world are preparing themselves for the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area come July next year. Where they know they're going to beat us is finances. We are not ready financially to participate in building the Africa that we want. And that is why it is imperative that come July next year, we must have at least a billion dollars deposited with the bank in Africa. Yeah. For people who are not used to big dollars, that sounds like a tall order. I can tell you, my brother and sister, it is not. It is something we can do very easily. But we have to unshackle our minds and begin to believe in ourselves and in each other. So when the database comes out, please be part of it. When the fund is launched, please be part of it. When we start launching Wakanda, the architects, please be part of it. Belong to your sector. Let's know who you are. Let's prepare for July 20. We want to hit Africa with a bang. Yes. You see, you don't go to China and find black people driving the Chinese development agenda. You do not go to Mexico, you do not go to Europe, you do not go to India, and find black people driving the development agenda for those nations. You therefore must not, should not, and definitely by God will not go to Africa and find non-Africans driving the continental development agenda. Will happen if you choose to vacate that place, that place that has your name. The choice is yours. The choice is yours. Are you ready to give up your place? Are you ready to have others come in and take over your place? No. Are you ready to say, my children, my grandchildren, your inheritance in Africa, I'm ready to give it up. No. You see, in spite of centuries of exploitation.
studies say they've only tapped into maybe 20% of Africa's wealth. Only 10% of Africa's wealth. And every day, more and more natural resources are being discovered in Africa. In your Africa, in our Africa. We come from an amazing continent. Endless riches. The heads of states are saying, the children of Africa must be on the driver's seat. I have no doubt in my mind that now that we know, we are going to say, enough is enough. enough. And now that we have awoken, those of us who are awoken, we're going to pick up our African drums and we're going to beat a beautiful melody to the world. And we hope those who are around us who are not yet awoken will join us and sing along as we let the world know that the children of Africa in the diaspora are saying, Enough, enough is enough. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. enough, is enough. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.